Welcome to another episode of the Family Gamers Podcast. This is episode 379. Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Family Gamers Podcast. Who are we? We are the Family Gamers. I am your host, Andrew. And, of course, I am joined by my lovely and wonderful wife, Anitra. That's me. She's the best. Best co-host in the biz. I don't know about that. Ah, sure. Sure. Anyway, as Anitra said, it is episode 379 of the show. And I think this week, I've got a fact about... I think this is a... um. This is a topic that we don't often cover on the Family Gamers, and this is trucking, like old I'm, school. Like okay, I mean that's how that's trucking. how the games get to your they, friendly local game store. Yeah, if they don't go on trains, they go on trucks. I mean, they got to go on trucks at some point, unless your friendly local game store is literally next to a train. Station. No, but when I say truck, I mean like long haul trucks. Yeah. So like, yeah. I don't know, whatever. Anyway, I'm gonna talk about the classic Peterbilt 379. This is a semi-truck that was built from the late 1980s until 2007. It replaced the Peterbilt 359. Uh, It has recently been replaced in about the last 15 years or so, but the Peterbilt 379 is super, super popular because it just keeps going and doesn't break. It was and still is easy to maintain and repair, and a well-maintained Peterbilt 379 semi can run 750,000 miles without being rebuilt. Some of them can get over a million miles. That's a lot of miles, even for a long-haul truck. Uh, it's, it's crazy. Apparently, this truck is super common to customize, and you can like buy all sorts of customization stuff for it, things like that. <gasps> The Transformers movie used a Peterbilt 379 for Optimus to Prime. To be Optimus Prime. Yeah. Is that what you were gasping That's about? That's what I was gasping at. Yeah, 1992. At. The actual truck that they used for the movie was sold for about $125,000. So a little tiny piece of Transformer nerd history, but also a, a kind of a classic truck that like falls right into our wheelhouse as you know, uh, ha, ha. elder millennials. That's the, the time period that we were... Um, kind of actually paying the most attention to these kind of things. So there you go. That's my fact for the episode 379 is the Peterbilt 379. All right. Well, as usual, I have a message from our sponsor. As a reminder, First Move has been letting us know how they would work with a young family, earning a combined $100,000 with a net worth of about $25,000 and the goal of buying a home in the next few years. One of the most surprising areas that a young client, like the one in our example, can get out of working with a professional advisor is in using that person as a financial coach. A lot of the conversations we would have with this client would focus on education and making sure they understood what options and decisions they had available and why those were important, like the difference between a traditional and Roth retirement account. Part of this is also having someone to be accountable to for those very short-term goals like how much is being saved each month or actually setting up a budget. And simply having some accountability is often enough to create positive change. Go to firstmovefinancial.com slash familygamers. There you can set up a quick free phone call to see if First Move would be a good fit for you. All right. Thanks so much to the team at First Move Financial for sponsoring another episode of the Family Gamers podcast. We couldn't do the things that we do without partners like First Move Financial, so Mm -hmm. we really do appreciate it. All right. So... Technically, on our last show, Anitra, we talked about the July monthly report. Yes. But it's already September, yeah, which now means it's September. we should talk about the August monthly report. So we need to make sure that we talk about what we've been playing and also the monthly report. Mm-hmm. Which order do you want to do these things in? Uh, let's talk about what we've been playing first. Okay. There's a couple of games that we have just been playing a ton of, like a ton of them. And the first one is a game called Star Trek Chrono Trick. So we actually talked about this two weeks ago. We did. But we've been playing a bunch more of it so that we can review it. Mm-hmm. But the super short soundbite review is if you like Star Trek, and especially if you like the idea of the way time travel tends to work in Star Trek, you'll probably enjoy this game. If you don't like time travel and you don't like Star Trek, stay away from this game. 
<laughs> yeah, this game, I don't actually know the, when it was officially released. I don't know which series are and are not included in this, but like clearly original series, next generation. I mean, the game looks like a next generation, you know, thing, but Voyager is definitely in there. Deep Space Nine is in there. Enterprise is also in there. Enterprise. Oh, it's yeah. so sad. All right. Because Jeffrey Archer is in there. Yeah. Uh, but I don't know if Discovery is it, in there. And it, it doesn't it really look like. It definitely doesn't have Strange New Worlds. Discovery, in it. Strange New Worlds or yeah. any of that. Yeah. Yeah. But I will say, if you like, you know, call outs to like real deep cut Star Trek stuff. There's definitely some of that there's in there. A lot of, there's a lot of that in this. And the thing is that you don't need to know any of that to play the game, which mm-hmm. is good. Like we played it with our son, Asher, who has a passing familiarity. He's watched a little bit of Star Trek uh, other than Star Trek Prodigy, which mm-hmm. we highly recommend. Yep. But there was still enough there to keep him interested. And it didn't really matter that he didn't know what all the stuff was. So I mean, we talked about this last week. This is a reskin of Chrono Knots, which mm-hmm. was another uh, Looney Labs game, but it was a reskin that was done with a lot of love. And oh, yeah. it's, uh, you know, it's a little bit of a nuisance to set up. And so one of the things, and what we're going to talk about this in the review is that once you get it set up, you're probably going to play it a couple of times in a row because the actual game itself goes pretty quickly. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm going to save kind of some more of my comments and things like that for when we actually do record that review. Uh, but definitely, uh, Keep your eyes peeled. I don't think it's going to be long before that comes out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We also learned super kawaii pets. (laughs) So this was actually our date breakfast game this past week. And it is one of those games that there's not a ton of depth here, but it latches on to the theme that it wants to represent and does that theme well. Yeah, this is basically a set collection tableau building game where the premise is that you are getting unhappy pets and you are either giving them food or love or bringing them to the vet to make them happy pets. Mm -hmm. And then there's a second level to that, which is finding them, you know, places to sleep (laughs) as well. So, I mean, it, it is a very basic game. This is not a game that is supposed to be complicated. This is a great little cute family game. I really think all of our kids will appreciate it, right? This is not a game yeah. for the you know yeah. heavy gamer, but absolutely something you can get to the table with really any ages. I mean, there's no reading on the cards. It's pretty right. much yeah, just symbol symbols. matching. So yeah, this is a, a really nice, simple family game with set collection and some tableau building. And I have to point out, I think the box says they're sad pets, but I think unhappy pets is a better term because... <laughs> All of the cats looked angry. Yeah, they didn't the, look the sad. The dogs are sad. The cats are PO'd, <laughs> <laughs> which is, I suppose, the way it normally goes. Which is true to life. Right, yeah. Right. But the art is great in this. It's kind of got this chibi art. I mean, super kawaii pets. Uh, kawaii, you, you, yeah. You get that sense from it. Uh, it's just, it's a cute little fun game. Yeah, that was neat. Mm-hmm. All right, another one that we played is the game Mojo. Do you want to talk about Mojo? Um, Sure. Mojo is a classic card game in the you know numbers on cards genre (laughs) mojo is a game of trying to get the lowest score each round and it's also a card shedding game but it works a little bit differently than other games in that style that we've seen before i actually read the rules learned it and then played it on board game arena and then did a not great job teaching it to the family (laughs) (laughs) But we've learned it now. Yeah. So in Mojo, you've got your hand of cards. And as play goes around, there's a discard pile in the center of the table. If you play a card from your hand that is lower than the card that's in the center of the table, your turn's over. That's it. If you play a card that is higher than what's in the center of the table, your turn is over and you have to draw another card. This might be good or might be bad, depending on where we are in the round. But if you can play a card that's identical to the card that's out there, then you can play another card. Sometimes this means that you can put three or four identical cards out from your hand and empty your hand really quickly. Even then, that might not be your best possible move, because once you end your turn with three or fewer cards in your hand, you're not allowed to play any more cards. You put your cards face down and you reveal one each time it comes around to your turn. Once someone has revealed all of the cards that are in front of them, 
or if someone actually manages to play out all of their cards by some miracle, the round ends. Then everyone reveals all of their cards. Now comes the other weird part, which is the scoring. The cards are grouped with colors based on the number of the card. So zero and one are blue, like two and three and four are green. And then like the next couple of numbers are yellow and the next couple of numbers are orange. And then the highest numbers are like red or pink. Uh, That's 10, 11 and 12. In each color that you have, you only score the highest number in that color. So you might actually do better to have three yellow cards than to have a blue and a green and a yellow out in front of you. Because if you have three yellow cards, you're actually only going to score one of them. And you're remember, you're going for the lowest score. And you know, we saw this play out when we played because Asher was really focused on getting down and getting his cards face down. Mm-hmm. And I was just focused on minimization. And that really worked out well for me because I didn't really care if I was the one who was going out first because yeah. I had such low cards that it didn't make a difference. In fact, if you can get your cards really low and not go out first, you will hurt the person who went out first because... What we have neglected to mention so far is the mojo card. Whoever reveals all three of their cards or actually goes out takes this mojo card as an indication that the round is fully over. If they have the lowest score this round, the mojo card stays on its zero side, and that's great for them. If they do not have the lowest score, the mojo card flips to plus 10. They have to add 10 to their score where they're already not the lowest score. To me, that really just says you never want to be the one to go out because you're the one who's taking all the risk. So I don't know. It's interesting. It's but definitely an interesting hard, game in that way. But sometimes it's hard to avoid going out. Sure. So, sure. Yeah. Yeah. So that's Mojo. That's from 25th Century, another game that we have in for review, another game that we'll be talking about some more Fairly in soon. the future. Yeah. Um, next on the list is a game that we definitely are split on. <laughs> Very much so. Uh, and this is Cosmoctopus from Lucky Duck. So Cosmoctopus, another set collection tableau building kind of engine builder kind of a game. Yes. The idea here is essentially that you are summoning the great inky one. It's definitely got a little bit of that, you know, Cthulhu-esque thing, but it's really done in a kind of caricature, almost comedic way. Extremely cutesy kind of way and with no actual references to Lovecraft's mythos. This is a completely made up ancient space squid. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Like, I mean, also Lovecraft's were, but this is setting all of that aside. Right. Right. Stylistically, this game really reminds me of that kind of universal monsters kind of feel that Horrified had with the just the style of its art on the cards and things like that. It just kind of felt sort of like that 70s monster of the week kind of yeah yeah thing. I can see you that. know what i'm saying this is a really interesting game there are four four different essentially resources and there's all these different ways that you can kind of enhance your abilities and the goal is to perform essentially to perform these rituals that summon different tentacles of the great (laughs) inky one, right? I mean, that's essentially the game. Yeah, you're collecting tentacles, and once you have enough tentacles, you have officially summoned the great inky one, and you are the winner. Yeah. So I think there's a couple of things that you don't like about this game, but I'm going to key in on the one that is exactly what I do like about this game, which is that there's a ton of different ways to do things. And so you can really plan your moves out three or four turns in advance and say, okay, well, I'm going to do this, which is going to allow me to do that, which will let me do this other thing. But if that doesn't work out because Anitra moved, you know, the guy over here, then that's okay because I can pivot in this other direction. And so in the same way that you talk about Sagrada and I talk about role player and the, and the differences yeah. between those and what I like with role player and what you like about Sagrada, I think it's a lot of the same kind of thing where there were just so many options for you that you just like felt like, oh, this just stinks. It doesn't matter anymore. Um, Yes and no. I mean, I do like flexibility and being able to like have different goals you can work towards so you can pivot. Mm-hmm. But 
my remarks to you about halfway through the game is like, I can tell this has the feeling of being an engine builder game, but I can't build an engine no matter what I do. Like I advance one step and then I stop and then I have to come up with a new plan and I advance one or two steps and then I stop. Mm -hmm. And that was part of what felt frustrating to me, which it definitely felt like it was me, not the game, but it may have also had to do with I mean, these cards come out kind of at random, so you've always got a choice, but you don't ever have a lot of choice all at once. And so I think partly I wasn't making great use of the choices available to me, but also I didn't really like the choices available to Mm. me. Yeah, I mean, this is definitely a game where it benefits you to have the capacity to have short-term and long-term goals. Okay, I've got these two cards in my hand, and I kind of want to work towards those, but they're pretty, you know, expensive, so let me work on some other stuff at the same time that's a little bit easier to get, which will kind of help bolster me and move me along the process in order to get you know yeah. things towards the end. And I would say until about two-thirds of the way through the game, you were beating me. Yeah, I was definitely progressing faster than you were, and then I kind of hit a wall, and you started being like, oh, and I can do this, and I'll get two tentacles from doing this, and yeah. I can do this, and I'll get one tentacle from doing this, and then and we go from I have five tentacles and you have one to... You have six and I still have five and I'm now I'm trying to play catch up and I, I just couldn't get there. That's fine. I wasn't super far behind you when you won. So I you didn't had seven, feel like I, I was, think. I think at the end I had either six or seven, mm-hmm. but my, my plan for my next goal I was going for was going to give me two tentacles. So it right. didn't matter if I had six or seven. Yeah, I mean, look, this is something I love about this game because it really has a lot of different ways that you can play. Like in the beginning, the reason why you were so far ahead of me is because I was kind of investing in my engine and getting it to the point where I could do something and it would trigger a bunch of different things going on. And I love that about this game. I really, really like that. I find it really, really fun. I think this is a game that Asher's going to have a lot of fun with, even if he's not good at it. Mm, Maybe. Just because of all the options that he's got available to him. And for me... The whole worshiping the purple squid in the sky thing doesn't really bother me because it's so clearly made up, but I definitely understand that that could bother some other people. So that was the other thing for me about this game is it didn't make me uncomfortable enough to not play the game, but it didn't really draw me as a theme. And then the more we played the game, I'm like, yeah, I don't really, I don't love the idea of like, I'm picking up these pagan scriptures to you know, advance my cause and doing a summoning ritual to advance my cause and doing some kind of a sacrifice to advance my cause. Like, mm, I don't like it. And if the rest of the game had had really like clicked for me, I might have been able to overlook that because it is it's cutesy and it's made up and it's not taking itself seriously. Mm-hmm. But since I had a base level of already being a little bit uncomfortable with the theme also being not great at the game made me just sit with that like no i'm uncomfortable and i'm still uncomfortable sure so yeah it's definitely something to be aware of if we were not reviewing this game i would not play it again not because i think it's a bad game but it just it is not a good fit for me and look i think that's totally fair right i mean games work for people or don't work for people or whatever this one works for me it doesn't work for you yeah agreed All right, we need to talk about uh, one more, which is going to tease our theme for the week. (laughs) Sure. Uh, Yeah, yeah. Let's do it. So uh, as we may have mentioned a little while ago, of the three nominees for the Spiel de Jar, the only one I think that neither one of us had played is the one that won, (laughs) which was Sky Team. (laughs) Yeah, so we fixed that. So Andrew looked it up and said, you know what? It's on Board Game Arena. Let's try it. Um, So you... Did you read the rules? Did you watch a video? Yes, I watched a video. It was Monique from Before You Play. It was linked to on Board Game Arena. Okay. And they did a pretty good job. Plus, we kind of knew the opening scenario was easy, and it was a learning game, and we knew that if we screwed it up, it was not a big deal. I mean that, too. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I I just skimmed through the rules until I understood, like, okay, these spots do this, and these spots do this. And then I kind of dove in, and as I went through the first round, I was like, oh, okay, like... This, you know, this does this because all the tool tips and stuff that they had in place were really, really helpful. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So, yeah, we played Sky Team. We tried the first scenario and we crushed it. It was great. <laughs> I mean, we won. I don't know if we crushed it. I mean, it felt like we okay, crushed it. So, we landed the plane safely. Like, that clearly, is what matters. Yeah, clearly, this is a well put together game, right? It, it won the spiel. 
And the thing that I think is really interesting about this game is that it's not the kind of game where you can say, oh, we crushed it because it has a defined timer in the game, which you can affect <laughs> yeah. with your speed, yeah. but you have to bring everything to closure. It's not like you can yeah. just absolutely obliterate the enemy at the end kind of thing, right? Like you bring everything to a nice peaceful close, in fact, by stopping the plane. Yeah. And and I actually like I I love how that buttons up the game. I actually you know what I mean. Like I, I know it sounds silly to say, but like it puts like a, a little fermata after the period. It's just like ah, it's been all right. It's been done. It's been. It's not like we're, we're not like yeah, we landed the plane. Uh, you I know mean, what I mean? I mean, I felt like that. <laughs> <laughs> but but you know what I'm saying? Like it's a package. Like it it's a package, and you close it, and you put the stamp on it at the end, and you send and you're it done. on its way, and yeah. it's done. And, all right. And yeah. I actually really yeah, yeah, like that about this game. It's not just this, like, just you run past the finish line as hard as you can <laughs> kind of a thing. I, don't, I find that kind of appealing. You touch down gently. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. All right. Yeah, I can see that. I'm definitely looking forward to playing this some more. And it has now gone on our uh, look for at the FLGS wish list. Yeah. I mean, we, uh, we're we going to be trading some games in. And so knowing that we were going to have some store credit, I was kind of doing the little list of what games do I think I you know want to pick up. And Sky mm -hmm. Team's on mm -hmm. that list. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. all right. So that's that. Cool. Uh, so that's it for the last two weeks. Um, okay. Not a ton of games, but the games that I played, I played a lot. <laughs> uh, so let's go into our August monthly report. You want to get started? Sure. So I played a lot more with you in August than I did with anybody else. I don't know if that's encouraging or not to you, <laughs> but... I mean, yay. <laughs> I played 25 unique games 42 times. Oh my gosh. Oh. I feel so... I mean... You want to talk about like an inadequacy complex? Like I feel so inadequate when you list your games. I played 15 unique games 21 times. In okay. The month of August. Like barf. My H index was two this month, which is really bad. Mine was three, but pretty much because of playing Chrono Trek three times. Yeah. Well, I have I have Chrono Trek at three and Trio at three. Yeah. And then Secret Same. Identity at two and Roll of the Top Journeys at two. And everything okay. else is one. I also have Star Trek, Chrono Trek at three, and Trio at four. I also have Grove at four, Jinx at three, and Donuts at three. The attentive listener will notice that two of the games that we did Snap Reviews for in August are on that list. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> come on, right? And then, you know, at least one or two that we will be doing Upcoming. Snap Reviews for yeah. are also <laughs> on this list. So, yeah. I don't know really that i have anything particularly exciting right most of my games were played at home easily you were the most the games that i uh, played with like it's not even close same i mean yeah. most months you and asher are close in mm -hmm. my stats it was not close in august probably because asher was spending a lot more time away from home so i played twice as many games with you as i did with the next person which is a tie between asher and claire all right well i think September might continue this trend as we get into the school season, but hopefully things will settle down and we'll, we'll have a robust October. All right. How's let's that? let's plan for that. All right. Speaking of things that are robust, the uh, Family Gamers community on Facebook is quite robust uh, and we have deployed the kittens. Kitten is so cute saying, join us. Join us. All right. So I'm going to get the welcomes started by welcoming the entire Kezi family. Welcome to Christy. Welcome to Johnny. Welcome to Robert. Welcome to Andy. I'm in favor of anybody named Andy coming into the Family Gamers community. <laughs> what? We are glad that you have joined. A couple of people have already popped into the post and said hello in the community. We are at exactly 880 members right now, which is super exciting. Nice. Let's talk about some games that we've been playing with our family and maybe some recommendations, some questions, anything like that. We definitely would welcome you mm -hmm. to head over to thefamilygamers.com forward slash community and uh, join in. So speaking of the community, if you are in the Family Gamers community or you are listening to this podcast or both and you are planning to go to Unplugged, PAX Unplugged, at the beginning of December, I am here to tell you that it is now official that the Family Gamers will have four of our writers at the show yeah. and some of their families. So we've got yes. a whole... Big, giant group of people that are going to be at PAX Unplugged. So if you would like to see us, if you want to play a game with us, 
if you want to grab you know a bite to eat um definitely reach out and we would love to see you we got a chance to play some board games with fans of the show last year and we it was, did it was, it was fun it was wonderful it was a really good time so definitely reach out to us on whatever channel we'll cover all that stuff at the end but um it is locked in that uh, anitra did you know that you're going to PAX Unplugged? I, I, I did. I got my <laughs> email saying that my media badge has been approved mm-hmm. and that we are, uh, at least in theory, going to run another Learn and Play. Mm-hmm. Although that is planned for Sunday. We don't know what game. Yeah. yeah. That's, it's in the works. It's, I have, we'll get there's there. an email we'll in my inbox there. I haven't it's replied fine. to. There's months. It's, there's it's months happening. To it is happening. Out. Yep. 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 So Anitra and I will be there. Our staff writer, Nick Martinelli, who you've heard on the show a couple of times, will be there. Jeremy Pike will be there with his family. Our kids are going to be there. It's going to be a pretty good time. So definitely. And chaotic. Yeah, it'll be chaotic, but that's okay. We love chaos. Speak for yourself. <laughs> All right, let's get to some back talk, shall we? Sure. So uh, this week's back talk was to talk about date games. Well, because that's what we talked about. That's what week. we talked about. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I will start with the only comment we have on Facebook, which is uh, because we forgot to post it on I Facebook. totally forgot. Week. I'm so sorry. Uh, but anyway, here we go. Mark Spector, fan of the show, the owner of Grand Gamers Guild, who just wrapped up a successful Kickstarter for the reprint of Tirna Nog. Uh, he comments on this and says, yes, I took a date to Real Food Cafe for breakfast. By the way, Real Food Cafe, great restaurant if you're in Grand Rapids. Anyway, mm-hmm. things were going well, so I invited her back to my apartment to play a game. Sure. There's no wink, wink, nudge, nudge there. <laughs> she's not a gamer, but she said yes, because she's always open to new experiences and because Mark was so charming. Come on. Yeah. We played Codenames Duel and had a great time. Two years later, she became my wife. Aww. And 18 months after that, she celebrated the successful Tiernanog Kickstarter with me. I like that story. Yeah. That's a story with a happy ending, which yeah, I appreciate. Yeah, it's so nice. We did get quite a few responses in Discord. Because we posted in a timely manner. <laughs> Shh. Quiet you. I'm not blaming. I said we. <laughs> My favorite of all of these is actually the first one. Coriolania is the screen name. He says, My wife and I really enjoy playing King Domino with the Giants expansion. We picked it up for our 10th anniversary cruise to Alaska. We'd sit on the deck, wrapped in blankets, looking at glaciers and wildlife while we played. I guess that's like a date. Yeah. I, mean, I would totally say dates. that's a date. Like, whatever. It's a date. Yes. It's a date. All right. JP, fan of the show, says our all-time favorite date games are the Sherlock Files series, which is that like the Sherlock Holmes consulting detective? I actually don't no, know. I think that's so a JP, different one. Like, tell me what this is. And an older game from 2012 called Divinair. By the way, it would be hilarious to see a couple out at like a restaurant like flipping through the newspapers for Sherlock Holmes and something like that. That would be ridiculous. So obviously yeah. it's a different game, but whatever. We'll usually have a small just-in-case game stowed away. That's me. Anitra. <laughs> <laughs> but playing games isn't often a key part of our date night. Our first date, which I'm not sure either of us acknowledged as a date when we sat down, was at Snakes and Lattes in Toronto playing Trollhalla. The spark we felt that day is what encouraged us both to navigate some difficult times to find our way to our long-term partnership. Aww. Aww, another happy ending. I love this. This is a great question. Uh, we got a response from Adrian who says, I don't have a partner, but I play a, a lot of games now with my sister. I hesitate to say that during the pandemic, we picked up Rummy Cube for the first time and we played that a lot. It's okay, Adrian. Like, we hated on Rummy Cube a little bit, but if you enjoyed playing it, that's fine. I mean, we hate on Munchkin all the time. <laughs> people like that game. Yeah. And Adrian says, now, now they've been playing a lot of Sagani. Kristen Post, she says, my husband is not a gamer, so our date nights with board games are not very common. However, the one game he does admit he likes is King of Tokyo. And the few he'll tolerate are Azul, Tetris, and Lucky Numbers. Those are good choices. They are good choices. Really great casual games. Derek Bruff, another longtime friend of the show and host of the First Player Token podcast, says, my favorite date night game story. We were at a new coffee shop for the first time. Emily noticed the charming wood tables and said, this would be a great place for a game. And I said, as a matter of fact, I happen to have a game. And I pulled a button shy wallet game out of my pocket. I just like literally, <laughs> this is exactly an intro right now. That's so funny. It does really feel like something I would do. A hundred percent. Derek concludes with, she was right. The tables were great for gaming. I love it. I really appreciate the back talk from the community. It's really, really fun and so heartwarming, especially this week. We've got another question for you at the end of the show that we will share that is unsurprisingly about this week's topic with that let's take a quick break give our listeners a snap review and when we come back we will talk about our topic that we have not told you what it is yet Ooh. 
we've teased you about what it is, but we didn't actually tell you. So we'll tell you after the break. We'll be right back. You know who I am? It's a secret. Everyone who watches these knows who you are. We do this every week. You don't know who this identity is. That kind of secret identity. Well, I, yes, that's the game. Yes. This is a snap review for Secret Identity. Secret Identity is a three-day player game designed by Johan Benvenuto, Alexander Droit, Kevin Jost, Bertrand Rue, and published by r r Games in the United States. This casual party game takes around 45 minutes to play. Let's start with the art that's in Secret Identity. There isn't really much of it except on these clue cards. We'll explain how those work in a minute. But the graphic design is neat with these magnetic flipboards and this slot to hold your clues. I'm not sure how I feel about keys representing secret identities, but it ends up working well enough. Speaking of keys, magnets, and clues, let's talk about the mechanics of Secret Identity. To begin, each player takes a player board, or personal safe, their voting keys, a scoring cube, and ten clue cards. Put the scoring board and the mystery keys, that's the gold ones, face down in the middle of the table, and put an identity at each of the eight numbered arrows around the board. This is true no matter how many people are playing. Each player takes a mystery key, looks at the number secretly, and inserts it into their safe face up at the key icon. Make sure nobody sees it when you close the magnet. That is your secret identity. Then each player uses up to three of their clue cards to give clues about who they are to everyone else at the table. They can put them on the is-like side or the is-not-like side of their safe. Then using their voting keys, everyone chooses who they think each other player is and gives them the corresponding key. You'll want to hide this number two until the big reveal. Keep putting these keys face up into your safe, just like the mystery key. Once everyone has voted, reveal the votes. Players get one point for a correct vote on someone else, and one point for every correct vote on their secret identity. Discard all the identity cards, return all the keys, and do it again. There are four rounds in secret identity. But wait, there's more. You only get 10 clue cards total. So you're gonna have to figure out how to distribute those for your clues. No overcluing. <sighs> that last round can get pretty interesting and difficult. Whoever has the most points at the end wins. So Anitra, let's talk expectations. What did you expect from Secret Identity? You told me it was fun. <laughs> uh, I was kind of unclear at first at how this game played. So I hoped it didn't involve hidden goals or like social deduction. Well, I wondered if it had anything in common with the key, those games from Haba, when I first opened the box and there were all of these keys. I liked the finish of the player boards, uh, but I couldn't really figure out how all of this stuff came together. But I think we were both surprised with this game. What about you, Anitra? Um, this was a lot of fun. <laughs> The clues people come up with get really, really interesting. It reminds me a little bit of other guessing games like Similo or So Clover, where it helps to look at what all the options are to determine what clues are eliminating or pointing you towards. I had a lot of trouble seeing the symbol cards from across the table, though. Both the text and the symbols are just a little too small. This is a hard game for old eyes. <laughs> I definitely like guessing games like this where your choices are constrained. It really forces you to be creative, to give everyone else the right clues despite not having a lot to work with. And we found out that when playing with our kids, sometimes people didn't know who the identities were, so we would just check around the table as we put them out, and if anybody didn't know an identity, we just discarded it and used the next one. There's a pretty good stack in the box. And that actually worked really well for us. So Andrew, would we recommend Secret Identity? Well, I really like that this game is a net positive all the way around. There is only shared success in Secret Identity, which makes it a fantastic family game. This one isn't good for the date pile, but it's definitely good for a feel-good game with a little bit of silliness and some laughter. As we mentioned, it's easy to adjust this to fit your family. The pool of identities is visible to everyone, 
so you can make sure that you only use characters that everyone at the table knows. The only downsides are that the keys can get a little cumbersome, and with a larger group, some people, like you said, might struggle to make out the small text and the symbols. So, yeah, we absolutely recommend Secret Identity. In fact, we're going to give it four and a half bushy mustaches out of five. And that's Secret Identity in a snap. And we're back. Oh, hello. Oh, there's people here. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Andrew, do you want to tell them what the topic actually is? Yeah. So, all right. So we said there was a tease. It was the whole Sky Team thing. Our topic this week is Board Game Arena. And just talking about Board Game Arena, why Board Game Arena is so valuable. Obviously, when the pandemic happened, everybody was stuck in their house and not everybody had board gamers in their house that they could play games with. And so that whole remote gaming thing was a huge part of it. But that's not the only reason why it's so valuable. Yeah. So both of us were playing on Board Game Arena before the pandemic, but we definitely both stepped it up during the pandemic as well. Here are some things that we always appreciate about it. First of all, yes, you can play games with friends or with strangers anywhere around the world. It's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the other one, which is actually really, really big for us, like I do think we'll buy Sky Team, but like yeah. there still might be an element of playing this game on Board Game Arena because if we're just busy, like I know there are some people who can leave a board game out and then like come to the game and sit down and play a little bit and then leave it there for a while. We're a family of five. That is not happening. With two cats, by the way. Yeah, it's the cats at this point. The, the kids would respect it, but the cats do not. We have a cat who literally tries to sit down on board games that we're playing if we don't shoo him away. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, he does it in a very loving way. Yes, it's very much like, I want to be where the people are. Mm -hmm. But yeah, no, we couldn't leave a game out for that. Yeah, so, so that's another reason is just this yeah. ability. Like when we get busy, if we want to scratch a little bit of that board gaming itch, even if it's a game that we have, we can just fire it up on BGA. Now, the caveat to that is if two people are playing from the same IP, you have to have premium accounts. Uh, at least one of them, yeah. I think, has to have a yeah. premium account. Yeah. So that's kind of a, a thing to keep in mind. Something we've talked about in the past and I really, really appreciate is that Board Game Arena does most of the bookkeeping in games for you. Uh, mm -hmm. There are a couple of games that I enjoy on Board Game Arena that I probably wouldn't play in real life. Like I've tried them and been like, nope, not interested. It's too fiddly. There's too many things I need to keep track of. No, thanks. Yeah. So there's this great debate about, you know, does Board Game Arena hurt board game sales, right? Or, or not even Board Game Arena necessarily, but like digital board games. Does mm -hmm. that hurt board game sales? Does it not? Well, we were playing a lot of seasons on Board Game Arena and we loved it so much. I was like, man, I'm going to go buy this game. So we bought it. And let me tell you. We played it exactly once. Once. <laughs> And it was just like, there are so many pieces in this game. Like, I am done. I don't so need, many it was things just to like, keep track of. It totally ruined the game experience for me. And I think it's just because I was so used to it all getting taken care of. Sure. Right? Another great thing about this is the whole try before you buy thing. I mean, it, it's tremendous. Even if it's like, Seasons was another example for this. You could just add an expansion. So if you have mm. a game, you could play the game that you Sometimes, already know yeah. and add an expansion and decide whether or not you want to pick that expansion up. This actually leads into the next thing. These days, there are a lot of tutorials available on more and more of the games that are on Board Game Arena. And I don't mean like sit down and watch a video of a how to play. I mean, literally, it walks you through, okay, because you've done this, like now you need to do this. Most of the tutorials are very short. It's like one or two turns, but it's enough to show you how to play, mm -hmm. not just tell you what to do, which is awesome. I have a few times used Board Game Arena as a way to play a game for a first time before we play it in real life. Like, even if I have the box, like I'll pull out the rules and read the rules and then be like, okay, let me try this in real time on Board Game Arena before I sit down and try to teach it to people in the family, which doesn't always work as we saw with Mojo. But yeah. like I said, we got there eventually. <laughs> well, I mean, look, different people learn in different ways, right? Some people yeah. learn well by reading. Some people, a lot of people learn by doing. And it's just another way to be able to do that. Yeah. Yeah, I would say, uh, and we'll talk about this a little bit more, you play a lot more on BGA than I do. A lot more on BGA than I do. I do. It scratches that itch with a lot of asynchronous games that I can just be like, oh, I want to take five minutes to just do something a little bit puzzly. I have a couple of games open. You know, these two or three, you know, it's my turn. 
Yeah. Okay, I'll take my turn. Yeah. And and I made a concerted decision basically this past week to inject a little bit more joy in my life. <laughs> and I'm actually going to be using BGA to do that. Oh, nice. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll play games with you. Oh, I appreciate that. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, coming back into BGA, I was really impressed. If you have used it in the past and you are not an active user right now, they've really, I mean, obviously they've added a lot more games, but even the infrastructure around everything is much more impressive than it used to be. Yeah, but there are tons of games and there's so much more publisher support now for Board Game Arena. So I think they're seeing that they probably get increased sales from it, from exactly what we're talking about. Well, Days of Wonder did a study on this and they basically showed with the study that physical board game sales fuel digital board game sales and digital board game sales fuel physical board game yeah, sales. Yeah, it's it's a virtuous cycle. Mm-hmm. But because of that, there are so many more games on there now. And sometimes games come to Board Game Arena before they're easily available at retail. At least in the States, right? So it could be something that came out in Germany. Right. They'll, you know, put it on BGA. We can play it. We can, you know, kind of get used to it. And then by the time we figured it out, <laughs> it's available in the United yeah. States. So that's helpful. So we're going to talk about our five favorite games to play on Board Game Arena. Yeah. So let me say this. There are other games that I love playing on BGA specifically because they are games that you would never play with me. Yeah, I I did not include those on this list because I thought this was a we list, more of a we list than a me list. But I can talk about some of those as well. Yeah, why don't we do the top five, which is really two of yours and three of mine that we really, really like on Board Game Arena, but would also happily play in other ways, Mm -hmm. I think. And then we can talk about a few that maybe we play because we can play them on Board Game Arena. Yeah, so number one for me is Seven Wonders Duel. This game is fantastic on BGA. It is so good. So good. Yeah, I wouldn't hate playing Seven Wonders Duel in person, but... The bookkeeping is so nice. Yeah, I don't have to flip a card. I just click on stuff. It's awesome. It tells you exactly how much every card would cost for you and for your opponent. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, what a great, really, really great implementation of that game. So Seven Wonders Duel is easily the game that I've played the most on BGA. Sure. Mm -hmm. Well, in that same vein, Seven Wonders is one of my favorite games to play on Board Game Arena. I think we talked about a year or year and a half ago now. I got an opportunity to play it in person, like with seven people. Yeah. And I sat down and I'm like, okay. I really enjoy this game. It's so much more fun on Board Game Arena. The game is a table hog. There is a lot of, oh, wait, does this do this? Does this do that? Because everything is icons, which is nice, but it's really hard to remember. There's seven different kinds of cards. Like, Mm -hmm. yeah, there's just a lot. And with seven people, like, that weight in between turns must just be interminable. I can't even believe it. Well, it's a a drafting game. So, like, everybody's playing simultaneously, but... Yeah, you need to pay attention to the people on either side of you Ugh. and what you're taking and what you're giving and what the people on either side of you are doing and all of that, plus the fact that it takes up a huge amount of space because in regular Seven Wonders, the cards are like tarot-sized cards yeah. and then you're laying them all out in front of you Ugh. making this tablet. Ugh. I'm exhausted thinking about it. However, the mechanics of the game are fantastic and that's why I really, really enjoy playing it on Board Game Arena. I'm really only looking at my own cards and the people on either side of me. It's kind of tallying up who has the most armies, who has the most of this symbol. It's really obvious who's doing what. And if I'm in a six or seven player game, the other players are off the bottom of my screen and I don't need to pay attention to them, but I can scroll down and see them if I want to. Right, right. All right, next one on my list is Happy City. Uh, Happy City is just this super cute, tableau building game it just it it hits at the right weight for me where i can drop into a game take stock of what's going on buy some stuff and leave right um and it just it fits that board game arena kind of dynamic really well we reviewed it a a while ago and it's fun to play but again the mechanics of having to deal with all the cards and put everything in its right you know row and all that eh, nah Board Game Arena. Thank you. It's fine to play in person. Again, I would never say no to playing Happy City in Mm -hmm. person. And there's not a ton of bookkeeping in that game, thankfully. There's enough, though. But there's some. There's enough. Yeah. And and there's enough bookkeeping in a game that, while good, is not great. Yeah. And so it's not worth it to do the bookkeeping in the game on the regular in my house. Yes. Sure. Okay. It's time for me to name a game that has nothing to do with bookkeeping at all. Mm Mm-hmm. (laughs) <laughs> unlike the previous three. 
I really enjoy playing Roll to the Top on Board Game Arena. And this is literally just because I can start an asynchronous game anytime with randos from around the world. And this is a perfect game for me to drop in and be like, okay, here's the current dice. What can I put where? Drop this, this, this. Okay, that looks all right. And then click and turn and go on with my day. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It's a lighter game. A lot of these are lighter games, you know, like the lucky numbers of the world, right? That's not on the list, but that's a, another good example. I, I do play that on Board Game Arena sometimes. Yeah. yeah, or Can't Stop or something like yeah. that. They're just, they're really easy to drop in, take stock, make a decision and move on with your life. It's it's great. Yep. And yeah, Roll to the Top, we still have. I'm, I would happily play that in person with people and mm-hmm. it's easy to teach. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I love that I can just drop in and play a turn of it in a minute. Sure. And then the last one in our top five is Space Space. So I learned to play Space Base at QsCon last year. Okay. And as soon as I learned how to play it, when we came home from QsCon, I was like, I know this is on Board Game Arena. Let me try it out here. And this is once again one where Space Base is an awesome idea, and it's so much better than uh, Machi Koro, which it gets compared to all the time. Well, it's an it's an evolution of the, it's the game it's in the s- a similar vein. It's like how every single deck building game in the world is better than Dominion. Now. <laughs> But the thing about Space Base is you've got 11 cards in a tableau in front of you at the beginning of the game. (laughs) And then you add more and Uh more and more Uh as you go. Actually, you might have 12 cards. I don't even remember. And playing it in person, it can get really messy. That's funny. (laughs) Again, playing it on Board Game Arena, none of that is there. And this is one where, because it has that Machi Koro-like style of on a person's turn, they roll the dice, but everybody can get some benefit. Mm -hmm. Space Base on Board Game Arena has some little checkboxes where you can say, take the best action for me when it's not my turn. Or or automatically pass if I don't have an action I can do on my turn or things like that. Sure. That just speed it up for everybody. Yeah, absolutely. um, Without actually taking away from the decision making that makes the game interesting right no that's good it's stuff like that that automata stuff that represents you i guess yeah uh really smooths things over a lot otherwise it would be just constantly just chunking along (laughs) yeah if you didn't have that space space would not be fun to play asynchronously sure you would only want to play it real time all right so our combined favorite five games Mm -hmm. to play on board game arena are seven wonders duel seven wonders (laughs) Happy City, Roll to the Top, and Space Space. Mm -hmm. Let's also talk about a couple of other games we like to play on there because they might be harder to get to the table at home. Sure. I learned for sale years ago now, and I would happily play this in person. I think if we played this at home, there would be a lot of hurt feelings because this is a double bidding game. And oh man, if we did not have hurt feelings in the first half of like, (laughs) I can't believe you outbid me on this thing. I can't believe I way overpaid for this dumb low value house. We would definitely get it in the second half when you're trying to put up your houses to get money back. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. But I really enjoy it. And that's the kind of game where sometimes I'll be like, I just want to play a quick game before I go to bed at night. I'll sign on and do a real time game of for sale. This is a game that for me has to be real time because there's too much information going back and forth to keep track of otherwise. Sure. For me, I love playing Zolkin. Oh. I bet you do. Yeah, I just, I love that game so much. That game is beautiful. I was so sad when I made the correct decision to move on from it from our collection because I knew that you would never, ever play it with me. Yeah, I am happy for you that Board Game Arena gives you an outlet to play that game because I understand why you enjoy it, but I just sit there and it makes me feel stupid. <laughs> I should don't don't feel that way. (laughs) (laughs) And that's why I don't play it. Like, I can appreciate it from afar, but I don't actually want to play it. All right. All right. I've got one more that I want to call out because I never would have tried this game if it weren't for Board Game Arena. And that's the game known as Six Nimpt on Board Game Arena and in German. Or Take Five, if you're looking at it in the U.S. This is a simple numbers on cards game where you're trying to predict what kind of numbers everybody else is going to put down so that you are not forced to take negative points. At some point, I would like to introduce this to our family, but I feel like it could go either way. And in the meantime, this is another one where I love just sitting down and playing with random people from around the world and just running through a quick game because it's got that really classic card game feel. Mm hmm. 
Uh, all right, I will talk about one more. I want to talk about Teotihuacan, but I feel like that's just Zulgan Mark II. I, so I, not... I did play that one once or twice. I mm-hmm. found it less complicated than Zulkin. Not by a lot, but a little bit. So I'm trying to think of another game that really hits for me really well in that way, and I guess I'm going to have to go with Lucky Numbers. It's uh, yeah, a game that yep. we eventually decided that we weren't going to hang on to at home after we reviewed it because we have to move on from good games at this point, yeah. right? It's just what it is. But it's got that drop in, click, move on with your life kind of a, a feeling to it, right? Yeah. We can really just, you don't have to be present for a long period of time, nor do you have to spend a bunch of time trying to figure out what you were thinking when you come back to the game. Every turn is very atomized in that way yeah. that you can yeah, just be like, oh, I have it. a single number. Where does it make sense to put on my board, given what I currently have? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So there you go. I see you scrolling through, and I'm going to point out, there are a few games I've played on Board Game Arena that I would not play on Board Game Arena again, but I would happily play in person. Okay. Um, and I think of that because I saw you scrolling past, and there was Turing Machine there. Okay, sure. Sure, sure, sure. Turing Machine on Board Game Arena, it works just fine, but it loses all of its charm for me. Okay. So this is one of those, we don't want this whole thing to just be a hype episode. There are (laughs) games where mechanically they work just fine on Board Game Arena, but they're just not going to work the same way they do in person. And that's okay. Yeah, it's a feel thing, right? Yeah. I I mean, I think any game that requires judging, even if they can get it to work mechanically, is going to lose a lot. Yeah, I have successfully played one or two of those real time on Board Game Arena, and usually there has to be some amount of chat going on yeah. to make it yeah, happen. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, no, I totally agree with that. So yeah, so not the Board Game Arena hype show, but telling you what we appreciate about it and some of our favorite games to play there, which are not necessarily the same as our favorite games to play in real life. Yeah, it is a different medium that serves an incredibly important purpose in the tapestry of board game land yeah 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 um, and i gotta be honest with you it's really inexpensive like i know they raised the prices but it's still like 30 something dollars for the year yeah even if you don't like that the free version you can play any game that's on board game arena you just might need a premium member to start the game and invite you mm-hmm. right <laughs> Yeah, in a, in a busy season, Board Game Arena is proving to be pretty helpful for us, and so we wanted to just kind of talk about how we interact with it right now in our lives and, you know, some of the ways in which it can uh, help. Yeah, so that's going to lead directly into our backtalk question for this week. The question is, hey, you, have you ever played on Board Game Arena? <laughs> I actually want to amend this. I'm going to say, do you play digital board games? Okay, right? And if it's not Board Game Arena, like, what do you play? Like, I'll give you a perfect example. Through the Ages is on Board Game Arena, but the iOS app for Through the Ages is so good. I was actually going to say something similar. Um, Railroad Inc. is on Board Game Arena, but it last I checked, it was only like the basic, basic stuff. And the Railroad Inc. challenge app is so much better. <laughs> <laughs> you know, while we're on the topic of digital board games, I just got an opportunity to get into the beta for the Codenames app. Okay. It's really good. I was kind of nervous because a lot of these games like this, are, you know, but um, they've done some really, really clever things with this game where if you go into like a team game, which is what Codenames is, right? Yeah. It just randomly pairs you with people. So you don't have to find people and you just randomly get assigned like one of mm-hmm. the roles. Either you're giving the clues or you're guessing from what people, you know, do. Mm. And then what they've done with it, which I think is brilliant is they've taken a lot of the clues that people give and and all of that work. And there's a way that you can actually like vote and say like, this was a good clue or this was a bad clue or Mm. whatever. And they, they take those and then they incorporate those into like solo daily challenges of just like, Hey, here's a grid and here's a word. There's, you know, work for or whatever. And if you get the four of them, then you've successfully completed this daily challenge, right? So they're mining all of this data from all mm. these people that are playing the game and using that to generate the solo part of this game. And they've done an incredible job of implying that there's a story or at least a progr- like there's a defined progression mechanic in this and you level up and you get like okay. different words and all this other. They've done really, really smart things with the Codenames app. Sure, sure, sure. Uh, and I'm really enjoying playing it. 
that's really cool. Mm -hmm. I like seeing some of these other things that are introducing matchmaking in a board game context. Because, I mean, that's been a thing in online shooter type games for years. It's nice to see it here now and be like, okay, more places like Board Game Arena who are like, you want to play with randos? Here you go. Drop you in. Right. Yeah, no. I, I don't know that it's doing any kind of weighted matchmaking in any way. I have sure. no I have no idea. I sure. mean, maybe they are. Maybe they're saying like, oh, this guy always guesses everything correctly. So we're going to put them against other people who are always guessing everything. Cor-. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. I, maybe they are. But, I don't know. But they're maybe with code names, it doesn't matter. Well, they're certainly mining data right, right out of this. Sure. And you can see the, the fruit of that in some of the other stuff that they're doing. And I think that's awesome. Yeah. Cool. Anyway. And that's right. not on Board Game Arena. Yeah. That's just Code direct iOS app. app. Keep yep. your eyes it's out. It's, for, a, it's in uh, beta it's right now. Out of beta. It, it's good. It, I haven't encountered any issues yet. All right. Cool. Mm-hmm. All right. So do you play board so, I'm games sorry. I'm sorry. online? <laughs> <laughs> Fine. If you play on Board Game Arena, what are your favorite games there? Otherwise, what are your favorite apps to play board games? I'm totally I guess. screwing up your question. I'm sorry. I, I'm trying to keep it simple and pithy, and you keep making me make caveats. All right. Andrew is going silent. <laughs> We're done. That's the question. Tell us about your online board gaming experience. And if you do play on Board Game Arena, you should join our Board Game Arena group. Groups are not a huge thing on BGA, but they do exist. And it is a way to play with folks who. You may or may not know, but you at least trust. They're defined interest groups. <laughs> yes, that's a good way to put it. If you would like to destroy me at a board game, Family Gamers AA. I will link to our Board Game Arena group in the show notes, but you can also find it by going to the community tab in Board Game Arena and search for the Family Gamers community. What else? <laughs> We're so original. <laughs> <laughs> You'll recognize the logo. However, I will say if you have questions about where to find us or you can't find us or whatever... You can reach out to us on all of the other places where you can find us. <laughs> the easiest one is probably the Family Gamers community. Head over to thefamilygamers.com forward slash community. It'll drop you right into Facebook or just go to Facebook and search for the Family Gamers community. You can also join the Family Tabletop community on Discord with us and First Player Token and JP from Little Big Thumbs and Brains on Games and... A uh, few others. Go to thefamilygamers.com slash discord to get an invite to drop in there. That is turning into a somewhat more active place than our Facebook group, which is kind of nice, I guess. Well, maybe I mean, it's a thing. Different people communicate in different ways, and that's okay. But if you would like to just send us a message or see what we've been up to online, find us all over social media at Family Gamers AA. That's Facebook and X and Instagram and TikTok. And yeah, you can find our YouTube with our Snap Reviews. This is not a backtalk question, but what do you think about podcasts that are on YouTube as podcasts? I'm going to attempt to do that, put our podcast up on YouTube before the next episode. What do you think? Is that a place you ever listen to podcasts? Mm-hmm. Apparently some people do it, so we're going to give it a shot. Yeah. At Family Gamers AA on all the things. All the things. Mm-hmm. Uh, of course, you can also just email us, Andrew at thefamilygamers.com. Anitra at thefamilygamers.com. It's hoodie weather. It is. We uh, told you we're going to be at PAX Unplugged, and you know how you're going to be able to recognize us? First of all, because of Anitra's beautiful beaming face, but <laughs> also because we tired are going to be face. wearing tired face Family Gamers merch. If you see that, yes. play games with your kids. It's not really a logo, desi- graphic, design graphic design or the Family Gamers logo. It's a good chance that it's one of us, but you could confuse everybody by getting your own shirts. <laughs> yes, you can. <laughs> and you should uh, at thefamilygamers.com slash merch. All right. Please, by the way, don't forget to subscribe to the show and tell everyone that you ever meet ever about the show. Whether I just your found friends this podcast or, and it's awesome. Yeah, whatever. Everyone, tell everybody about the show. Please leave us a review, not just a rating, but a review at Apple Podcast or whatever your podcast subscription source is. You can find us, obviously, on Apple Music, but also on Amazon Music, on TuneIn, on Spotify. You can ask your smart speaker to play the Family Gamers podcast. You can. The Family Gamers continues to be sponsored by First Move Financial. Go to firstmovefinancial.com slash familygamers and learn how the team at First Move Financial can help you pile up the victory points. Thanks again to the team at First Move Financial for sponsoring the show. Well, that's going to be it for this week. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think that we should go see if there's any new games on Board Game Arena we want to try. 
All right, let's do it. And uh, if we find anything we really like, we'll tell you about it in a couple of weeks. So until then, everybody, play play games games with with your your kids. kids.